Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to build this Yag Tiger. A while ago, it was pointed out to me that I'd only built a Yag Tiger in 15mm scale, and so I thought, why not build a slightly bigger one? So here we are. This is, as you might imagine, a Tamiya kit in 48th scale, so when I opened the box, I was not surprised to see some good quality sprues with Yag Tiger parts on them. These are exactly as neat and tidy as I would expect from a kit like this. There were no obvious defects, and indeed, if there were any defects, I didn't notice them. Everything went together nice and easily with very little trouble, though there were some minor problems, mostly caused by myself. The mould lines were quick and easy to remove where needed, there wasn't much by way of mould lines to begin with, so it wasn't a real problem. The parts in this kit are nicely detailed, and while I'm no Yag Tiger expert, I feel comfortable saying that this is reasonably well detailed and accurate. I'm sure there are other Yag Tigers that you can get that have more detail, but this one is rather good for what it is, and it doesn't pretend to have extreme accurate detail anyway. It's good, and if you've built one of these Tamiya kits before, you've probably got a good idea what to expect. I do have one minor issue though, not with any of the parts, but more a lack of parts. The kit should come with some poly caps, both for the drive sprockets and the main gun. They were missing from my particular kit, and often that's not really a big issue. It didn't stop the build from being completed, but it was a bit of a pain. As best I can tell, that's all that was missing. Anyway, here's the decals. There's not a lot of markings here, but there doesn't need to be. If this is not enough, I'm sure you can find some suitable aftermarket decals. This here is some weights that you can barely see because of the plastic they're wrapped in. I know you're very excited to see them, but you'll just have to wait a bit. This piece of paper has some information about the Yag Tiger, along with a couple of painting and marking guides. It is a bit basic, but that is usually the case with these kits. Still, it can be helpful when it's time for painting. Unsurprisingly, instructions are also included. These are a fairly big fold-out sheet type, which I'm not the biggest fan of, but they still function as instructions quite well. The diagrams are clear and laid out in a reasonably sensible way. This resulted in minimal confusion for old Herbert. That's what's in the box, let's glue some plastic together. We start with the lower hull, which needs to be glued together. This is a little bit uncommon in these Tamiya kits, they normally have a tub. It's not a bad thing, and it's pretty easy to put together. The parts are keyed, so you pretty much can't do it wrong. The whole rear goes on next, and like the sides, it's very easy. The rear plate slides into place from above, and now it's time for weights. These weights are optional, and I don't personally feel a real need for them, but I usually add them anyway as a demonstration. I choose to super glue these flat plates into place, and that's also optional. I do it just to make sure that these don't start rattling around. There isn't much chance they'll do that, but it's best to be sure. The thing that holds these in place are these plastic pins, which are obviously glued into place with plastic cement. At the front of the hull, I add these final drive parts. These are rather easy to place, and they are the same part for either side, so no need to worry about mixing them up. And now, the hull is ready for some wheels. There's only a couple of these, so preparing them shouldn't take too long. I start with the drive sprockets, and there's a bit of a problem here. There should be a delicious polycap centre for these, but there's not. So I just glue them together in the normal way, and they do go together easily enough. The idler wheels are made up of three parts, and the keying makes it nice and easy to get these together properly. And then there are road wheels. There are two kinds of these, both of which are comprised of two individual wheels glued together. The inner road wheels also have a hub glued to them, which is pretty simple to add. Obviously you've got to make sure you're gluing the correct wheels together, otherwise you'll end up with a wheelie big mess. After some time, you end up with a nice pile of wheels. And why wait any longer to put those wheels on the hull? I start with the idler wheels, they go on here nice and simple. Next, I add the road wheels, and it makes sense to start with the inner wheels, the ones with the hubs. If we don't put these on first, we won't be able to get them on past the outer wheels. You can see that the axles for these have a slightly different shape, 
I would assume that this makes it difficult to put the wheels on the wrong axles. I didn't try that though, and it's probably best just to put the wheels in the right place the first time. The outer wheels then go into place and this is just as simple as the inner wheels. The fit is good here, and there isn't a lot of play to these, but there might be a little bit, so make sure that the wheels look all nice and straight. Wobbly wheels are kind of undesirable. At this point I noticed that I'd missed a drilling instruction on the rear plate. Surely this is the first time you've missed such an instruction, Herbert? Haha <laughs> yes, first time for everything, right? Anyway, drilling the holes is simple. At this point I was just trying to avoid doing the tracks. The instructions wanted them done already, so why not add some of those parts we had to drill holes for? The jack mounting bracket, and it does seem kind of odd that we would have to drill holes for these, but I guess this hole maybe can be used for a different vehicle with a different jack position. That's just a guess, I have no idea. I do know that the brackets are very easy to install though. I follow that with the exhausts. These parts are identical, and the D-shaped keying makes it very simple to get these into the correct location. We don't need to worry about those holes in them, it'll be covered later and nobody will know they're there. These doodads, whatever they are, go into place next, and there's nothing tricky or noteworthy about these. The rear mudguards would be next if we were to follow the instructions, but I figure they might make it a little bit harder to put the tracks on, so it's time to skip back and put those on. I start with the drive sprockets. That's what the instructions want, and it does make sense. I start by gluing the short curved segments to the drive sprocket, and then a slightly longer straight section, and then I glue that into place on the hull. This is where not having a polycap for the drive sprockets is a bit of a problem. The polycap would hold it in place on the axle while you could jiggered the tracks around, just so you could get things lined up properly without having to glue the sprocket into place. It allows for some adjustment. I didn't get that this time, but it was okay anyway. I add the rest of the track parts according to what the instructions say, because I'm a good, non-rebellious, instruction following kind of guy. The parts are identical for each side, but some of them are in different positions. The tracks are not symmetrical, and you can see that in the way they protrude further towards the outside of the sprocket than the inside. So you've got to pay attention to the instructions and get the parts around the right way. Otherwise, you'll look like a right fool. I know some people don't like Lincoln length tracks, but Tamiya's are some of the easiest to work with, and this kit is no exception. The only way they could be easier is if they had keying so you could get perfect positioning every time. And I think they're much better than rubber band tracks would be. Now we can add those mud guards I mentioned earlier. Hooray! Just make sure you put them on the correct side of the tank. Or don't, I don't care if you want backwards mud guards on your Yag Tiger. You do you, fam, as the youth say. And now it's time for Jack. This needs a little bit of assembly. You've got to add this flat bit here, and then the handle. It's a little bit fiddly because it's small, but you wouldn't call it challenging. I set that aside to bond, and then I add the exhaust covers. These are both different parts, but it's easy enough to tell which part goes on which side because the keying is different, and now we can't see those holes in the exhaust. Now nobody will know they're there. I follow that with the jacking block thing, which goes into the two holes I had to drill at the upper right of the rear plate. Then why not put the jack into its place? It pretty much just drops right into place, and unless you add glue, it'll drop right back out of place. I did, of course, add glue. I don't want to lose my jack or be smited by the glue god. Next, I add the inner component, I guess you might call it, to the bow machine gun mount. You could also install the gun at this time, but it would be very easy to damage it, so it's probably better to do it later. I then assemble the rear wall of the casemate. There's a pair of big chonky doors that need to be installed here, and this is pretty easy. If you wanted, you could model them open, though with no interior, you'd just be looking into a big empty void. And we all know that when you look into the void, the void looks into you. Ooh. This little whatever it is goes on the upper left side of the plate, and that's rather simple. Below the doors, I add this thing. It seems to be a pry bar of some sort. I set that aside to bond, and then I thought it would be really fun to install this gun side. Or at least I think it's a gun side. It drops into the roof here like so. Conveniently, the roof also has most of the upper hull attached to it already, and onto that I add the front of the casemate. 
this is pretty much impossible to attach in the wrong position. It is easy, but it did need a fair bit of pressure to get it all the way into place. I didn't feel like removing it after the test fitting here, so I just added glue, mostly from the inside. It is always neater to glue from the inside where possible. I installed a machine gun mount next, and a little pressure was needed here too, but it's pretty simple. Then, why not attach the rear of the casemate? This doesn't have the big chunks of interlocking armour like the front does, but it is still keyed, and it still needed pressure to get it into place. Now it's time to drill more holes. At least this time, it wasn't a missed drilling instruction. Drilling holes is pretty simple, and we'll put something in them later. For now, it's time to glue the main gun together. This is a two-piece barrel, and the fit is rather good. It does need a bit of nudging and pressure to get it to sit together as neatly as possible though. I like to do this kind of thing in two steps. Once the first bit is lined up nice and neatly, the second bit usually follows suit quite easily. And here's another problem brought about by the lack of polycaps. The bit that holds the gun in place is designed so the polycaps will centre the gun mounting pins. Often with these kits, the gun mount will sit neatly in the holder anyway, and the polycap is only really there to hold it securely enough that it doesn't just flop around. But you can still build it properly without the polycap. I glue the gun holdy bracket together, and then I put the gun in, and carefully glue it into the bracket, and I do my best to get things lined up as though the polycaps are there. It isn't very strong, but it should hold. I set that aside to bond properly, and then, into the bottom of the upper hull part, I glue these panels. Whatever these are, they're simple as long as you don't put them on wrong. At this point, if you want to install crew figures, you'll need to install these little shelf seat things. There's two of these, and they can go below the driver's hatch or the commander's hatch. I've chosen neither. Then I go back to working on the gun, and I've found another area where there should be a polycap. We don't have those of course, but we do have this little O-shaped ring thing, and it goes here like so. Then on top of that, the gun in its mounting can be attached. It's not too bad an idea to pay attention to the instructions and glue this together the right way around. Once you're satisfied that it's going to stay together, it can be installed on the hull from the inside like so. It's not especially difficult to do this. I can certainly see the benefits of having the polycaps here. They would allow you to position the gun however you wanted it after it's in place, rather than having to guess like I did. It seems like now is a good time to join the upper and lower hull assemblies together, so I do that. As with a lot of larger things, I feel like it's a good idea to do this in sections. Once I was happy with the front, I add glue at the rear here. The whole thing goes together quite nicely. It's probably not a bad idea to put the gun mantlet together. We'll need it for mantlety things. This is comprised of four parts that are keyed and go together nice and easily. The only thing that's a little bit fiddly is the little, I guess it's a lifting bracket or something. You might need to nudge this a bit so that it sits nice and straight. Before I stick that on, I assemble this lamp. The front of this is keyed, so it's easy to get it together nice and straight. There's a mounting bracket for it, so it's probably a good idea to glue it into that. There's a D-shaped keying at the bottom of the mounting hole, so that you don't put it around backwards. Hatches come next, and the commander's hatch just plops right into place. Obviously it could be modelled open, and there is a commander figure you could put there, but it wouldn't be a Herbert Herbert video if we did that now, would it? The same goes for the front left hatch, though it would be a driver figure, I guess. The right hatch doesn't have the seaty shelfy thing, but if you had an appropriate figure, you could still have the hatch open and put it in there. Next, I slide the mantlet down the gun barrel and glue that into place. There's a helpful piece of keying on the top of the gun which guides the mantlet into place. This makes positioning easy so we don't end up with a mantlet on a slight angle. That would be terrible. After that, I install the headlamp on its little bracket. The gun does make this a little bit fiddly to get into place, but it is obviously still possible, and not especially difficult. I follow that with this little air vent, I believe. It's probably nice for the crew to be able to breathe. Humans are into that sort of thing, aren't they? Something a little bit more fiddly to install was the travel lock for the gun. The thing that makes it fiddly is that you've got to get it over the headlamp. Once it's over that, it's not hard to get it into the correct position, it just takes a bit of kajiggering. This might have been a bit easier to do before installing the gun, and probably the headlamp too. Though maybe it would also make it harder to install the headlamp. 
What matters is that it's on now, and we can add some tools. I thought you weren't putting the German crew in. Ha ha ha, new and original jokes. On the left side, we have this hammer. You never know when hammer time is going to strike, and you must stop. On the side of the hull below that, a shovel, which is good for when your crew just feels like digging random holes in the ground. That's all it's for. On the right side, an axe. This is for when there's an epic quest to go on, one of the crew can say, and my axe, except probably in German. On the sides of the casemate, I add the spare track links. There's a little recess for these to sit in, so it's pretty easy to get their positioning right. Just make sure you put the right parts in the right place, and that you've got them the right way up. You might have noticed a big gaping hole in the engine deck, and conveniently, we have this hatch that's the perfect shape for it. Almost like it was designed that way. On top of this little, I assume it's a vision device, goes this cover thing. I am of course just guessing what this might be. What matters is the part is on, and it's probably even facing the right way. On the front right of the hull, I add another dome thing. It looks the same as the ones on the engine bay door, and I'm assuming it's some sort of air vent. I believe, on a regular King Tiger hull, this would be located between the two forward hatches. The towing cables go onto the hull sides next, and these aren't particularly difficult to place. There's some helpful holes to guide them, and once you find the correct position, it's probably not a bad idea to add some extra glue along the length of the cables so they stay on the hull. The right hand side has some extra cable, and it seems a bit thinner than the one we just put on, but maybe sometimes you just need a thinner cable. I don't know, I'm not a cable guy. The cable on the left side of the hull goes on in exactly the same way, though it seemed like it would be a bit easier to put the starting crank on before the cables here, so that's what I did. Maybe it's just as easy to put the crank on afterwards. I'll never know. Above those cables we have this bar. It looks a lot like the one we installed on the rear of the casemate, and maybe it is. Maybe there's two of them, so the crew can sword fight with them. You've got to do something to pass the time, you know? The side skirts come next, though I guess if you wanted, you could leave these off. The detail for the little mounting things underneath these is there, you'd just have to not drill that hole in the side for them. Obviously I'm adding the skirts, because I think they look cool. The skirts and the matching front bit are pretty easy to put on, though it was a little bit tricky to apply pressure with fat fingers owing to their shape. For, I assume, air defence, there's a gun on a stick. It could just be a fun and different way to store the gun, or maybe it's to show passers-by that they have such a gun. It is a little bit fiddly to get it mounted on its pole, but it can obviously be done. I did it, and so can you. I set that aside, and add these little disc things. I'm assuming these are some sort of air vent, or maybe a cover for something. These are different in size, and that's why the keying is different for each of them. I add shackles next, and there's two of these for the front, and two for the rear. These should obviously be dangling down, in such a way that it looks like gravity is gravitying them. Gravitying is 100% the technical and correct term. I install the hull machine gun next, and this is just a matter of slotting the barrel into the hole in the mounting. The final touch is that gun on a stick that I assembled a moment ago. It goes here on the engine bay door. I've never seen a Yag Tiger with one of these, but as you've probably already figured, I am definitely not an expert on the subject. I think it looks interesting, so I'm not complaining about it, but if you wanted, you could omit it. Though if you do omit it, you might like to do something with the mounting point. Anyway, that's it. The Tamiya Yag Tiger in 48th scale is now completed and ready to do Yag Tiger things. Like, I don't know, breakdown, I guess? I think this is a really nice looking model, and that's not really a surprise. I feel pretty confident to say that you pretty much know you're going to get a good model with any of these 48th scale kits. If nothing else, Tamiya are consistent. Is it a super detailed, extremely fancy top end kit? No, it's not, but neither is it low quality. Not at all. The detailing is quite good, and I would say more than good enough for most modelers, and the engineering is excellent. Everything goes together pretty much perfectly, and that makes it a really fun build. Of course, my kit didn't have any polycaps, which made it ever so slightly harder to put together, but that's not really the fault of the kit. Probably just somebody or maybe a machine at the factory missed something. 
I'm sure I could have contacted Tamiya and got a set of polycaps sent out, but before building the kit I didn't think it would be necessary, owing to my previous experiences, and to be fair it wasn't really. I did get the kit built. I guess some people might find the lack of polycaps to be more of a problem than I do. That's the only complaint I have about this kit really. I'm quite satisfied with it and how it went together and how it's turned out. It was a nice, relatively quick build, which I also rather enjoyed. And the result, which I think is rather good, is that I now have two Yag Tigers. Do I need more? I probably do, but this'll do for now. I did, as usual, build this kit live on stream, so if you want to come hang out while I glue bits of plastic together live, that'd be cool. Drop by my Twitch channel and give me a follow. There's probably worse things you could do with your time. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comment section below. And if you haven't already done so, why not subscribe here on YouTube and smash that bell, or whatever it is we YouTube's folks say. Or maybe, if you have the means and you want to help Herbert Erpaderp do Herbert Erpaderp things, as well as see my videos a bit early before there's any ads, consider becoming a patron. You can find links to Patreon and all of my other things like Discord and social media in the description below. Take care of yourselves, be excellent to each other, and thanks for watching. Farewell.